Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. Now on a recent trip to the recycling center, I eyeballed this thing. It is a 4x3 LCD display. Now a few things that caught my eye with this particular panel. First of all, it's 4x3. Second of all, it's got inputs for composite, S-Video, SCART, and VGA, along with analog and digital tuners. Uh, there's also an inbuilt DVD player, but that's neither here nor there. Now, obviously, I'm a massive fan of CRTs, but something like this might just be perfect for a little retro gaming setup. At least it's good enough to be able to test certain systems, uh, be it from the Atari 2600, which only has an analog video RF output, all the way up to probably, you know, the first PlayStation thereabouts. Um, anything beyond that, you probably want to look for something with component that can do 480p or above. And generally, I'd prefer like a widescreen flat panel for, you know, systems from the PS2 and original Xbox onwards. But for something like this, it might be just perfect for retro gaming. The big question is, how laggy is it and does it handle 240p correctly? Now, for those who have watched the channel before, you've probably seen me pull out this thing. It is a little LCD display that I pretty much put together from random parts from AliExpress. The problem with it is it only does composite. Uh, it does have VGA and HDMI and also uh, an analog RF tuner, but it's missing the S-Video and it's missing RGB SCART. So while it comes in handy for doing a quick test of things, um, yeah, it's not the kind of thing that you really want to set up and try and play games on. It's a tiny screen and I'm pretty sure it does introduce a lot of lag and yeah, it definitely doesn't handle 240p correctly. So while this is handy for testing things, not really handy to game on, whereas maybe something like this will be. I guess we'll find out. Now, a few people have asked about what this thing is and how they could possibly build their own. So I may cover this in a future video, but um, yeah, leave me a comment if you're interested and I'll um, prioritize that. Now, as I mentioned, this is a 4x3 LCD panel and it comes in at about 20 inches, which is pretty much the biggest 4x3 LCD panels you can find. Obviously, things like this aren't sold anymore. And if you've seen V Westlife's recent video on the Olivia panel, he also showed off a 20 inch LCD panel, but I believe his was 800 by 600 resolution. And rather than SCART, it had components. So a little bit of a difference there. I think his also didn't have an analog tuner. So there's upsides and downsides to these kind of things. But again, these only existed for a short period of time. So you've got to take the good with the bad. Now this did cost me the princely sum of five Australian dollars. And there is a bit of a reason for that. First of all, it was untested. And second of all, if we can see the camera is going to focus. It does not have a standard AC power supply. It's actually got this 12 volt uh, mini DIN kind of thing, similar to an S-Video connector, but not exactly the same. Yeah, that's kind of the reason it was only five bucks and it was obviously untested because no power supply to test it. It was also pretty dusty, but I got rid of most of that. So it is a DM Tech LQ20 XTV and yeah, power source is 12 volts DC and yeah, takes about 60 watts to run this thing. So probably not the most energy efficient thing by today's standards. I'd say it's probably similar to what a 20 inch CRT would suck up. You'll also notice there's a weird panel here. And I did actually pop this off. It pretty much gives access to like an EEPROM that's inside. So I guess they use that to swap out different EEPROMs or maybe change firmware versions. No idea. I don't believe this actual panel was sold in Australia. It looks to be more of a European thing. And I did have a look online. There's very little information about this particular model out there. Pretty much the only thing I could work out was that it's 640 by 480 and yeah, the basic feature set. But uh, you could tell that just from looking around the panel itself. Over on the side, there is the DVD player. Uh, I haven't tested that out yet. Um, like I said, I didn't really buy it for that. The front has a little power button and there's some other controls on the side here. Uh, the other reason this was so cheap is it didn't come with a remote control. So I have programmed, throw it around. 
I have programmed just a Logitech Harmony remote control, so that should work as the remote control for this. But again, pretty much all the buttons you need are all on the side anyway, so no big deal. So this here is the very janky power supply that I built. Uh, yeah, four pin mini DIN, the fatter pins, not the S-Video type connector. And that's just wired up to a DC barrel female socket, which then plugs into this male socket and it's hooked up to a 12 volt, five amp power supply. So 12 volts at five amps is spot on 60 watts. So uh, yeah, it's cutting it pretty fine here, but I was thinking maybe I can measure it with this guy here, which uh, gives me an idea of how much current is being drawn along with watts and that kind of thing. So might plug that in and see what we actually pull out of it. Voltage is pretty high today. We're looking at 248 volts AC. Uh, Australia is supposed to be 240 and in some places even 230. So um, yeah, not many people on the grid right now by the looks of it. Let's plug this thing in. So the power supply just sitting idle is drawing 2.9 watts. Let me plug this janky connector in the back here. And we're now sitting at 3.8 watts. So about one watt usage in standby. Let's power this on. Oh, there we go. 59.3 watts. So yeah, pretty much at the limit of what this power supply can put out. It might be a good idea for me to get a slightly beefier one. But here we go. As you can see, analog TV tuner. Digital TV tuner, DVD player, video input one, video input two, S-video and PC input. And back to the analog. Let's hook something up to this thing. So for testing this thing out, I'm going to be using the Super Nintendo because it pretty much outputs all those different video options apart from VGA, I guess, but we'll get back to that. Let's just do all the analog video stuff. Let's just see how it goes with analog RF. Huh. Well, that's weird. So pushing the menu button on this universal remote actually changed the color of some of the LED strip lights. They do actually have a little dedicated remote for them. So I guess this must use similar sort of frequency encoding. Hopefully they don't go crazy at some point. Um, yeah, let's try auto program. So yeah, it is set to UK. Let's have a look at the other options while we're in here. Denmark, Ireland, Czech, Finland, Greece, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Poland, Spain, Sweden, Swiss, Turkey, and back to UK. So yeah, no Australia there. So I really doubt this thing was even sold in Australia. No idea why somebody would have brought this over here with them, but maybe it's a good thing for us. There we go. Cool. So RF looks okay. Not too much interference. It's perfectly legible. Now keep in mind, this is a Power Super Nintendo, so there are top and bottom borders. Normally on the NTSC version, that would fill the screen. So it's not the panel, it's just PAL Super Nintendo. Yeah, a lot of shadowing on these reds. That could just be an RF issue. So the speakers seem to work just fine. That's always a good sign. Although it does sound fairly hollow, but there is some sound settings in here. Yeah, okay, the music setting definitely helps it boost the uh, low and high frequencies. Speech kind of does the opposite, so it sounds terrible like that. But. There is also a user option, so seeing as it's got a five band graphic equalizer, let's... And 
that actually sounds pretty decent compared to the standard. Anyway, how well the um, mic is going to pick all that up, I don't know. Let's uh, try another video input. So this is my Super Nintendo breakout cable. I basically took a really cheap cable off AliExpress, uh, chopped all the bits off and just added sockets. You can actually crack these open. They're usually glued though, so I did just kind of put a little super glue to stick it back together. But yeah, this breaks out obviously stereo, stereo audio, composite and S video. And that way I can use half decent cables. These are not my half decent cables, by the way but I can use my own cables, uh, which are a lot better quality than the AliExpress stuff that you get. But for this test, I'll just go with the cheap AV cables. All right, uh, let's try and switch inputs, see if my lights behind me go crazy again. Digital TV, yes, they are going crazy. Oh, don't go into that, hang on. That's going to get distracting. Stop it. Let's see if we can, if I can fumble through these buttons. Ah, oh, there we go. All right, composite video. Doesn't look too bad. Definitely an improvement over RF, but that's not really a surprise. The red text is still hard to read, but yeah, composite is just going to be like that most of the time. And yeah, the red on the grid is a little bit blurry, but definitely not as bad as it was in RF. What I do like about this thing is the off viewing angle is pretty much perfect. Like it almost looks the same from here, looking at it from the side as it does from directly straight on. So yeah. Pretty decent screen for something in the, you know, mid to late 2000s. Stereo separation, even from over here, seems half decent. I can tell at least some of the ch different channels playing. Yeah, it's not bad considering the speakers are just mounted on the bottom. It's got decent separation. Let's push it up to S-Video. For S-Video, I do use like a decent cable because uh, S-Video, it's a lot more prone to interference if you have like a cheap non-shielded cable. Let's try not to disturb the LED lights. There we go. And yes, as expected, S-Video looks a lot clearer. And that red text is pretty much solid. There is a little bit of blur to it, but that could just be the Super Nintendo itself. Yeah, those lines aren't perfect. It could also be because this is a 640 by 480 LCD panel, so it's obviously fixed pixels. It may just not be scaling those things, you know, correctly to two or three pixels, I guess. The output resolution of the Super Nintendo is something by something. But yes, S-Video does definitely give a boost in clarity. Uh, obviously the audio is going to be the same because we're still using the same audio inputs. Let's go up to RGB SCART. Oh, and it automatically switched to RGB. So yeah, there we go. Um, yes, another boost in clarity by the looks of it. The colors seem to be a bit more bold. Um, but yeah, this text is now nice and sharp. There is a bit of noise coming through on this video test. Don't know if the microphone's gonna pick that up or cancel it out, but there is sort of a maybe five kilohertz buzz. Um, but yeah, that probably just interference in the Super Nintendo and in this fairly cheap RGB SCART cable. So I know this probably looks a little bit different on camera, but for me, the user mode, as I've set it up, looks pretty natural. And then it just disappeared. Bastard. The standard mode seems to over sharpen everything and also boost the brightness a little bit too high. Yeah, there's sort of halos around all the text letters. And dynamic is even worse. That's like garish. Mild isn't so bad, but yeah, user definitely looks the most natural. 
And yeah, the grey ramp looks pretty good. Um, there's definitely a black square and I can see the first sort of darkest grey. And it continues up and I can still make out pretty much all the separation here from the lightest grey or whites. And um, yeah, the backlight isn't too bad either. I can't really tell the difference. Um, it looks pretty black for like an older LCD. So I'm pretty happy with how the screen actually performs and, you know, the audio as well, especially once you set it up, you know, to your personal preference. So let's take a look. We should test out the VGA connector, see what it can do. All right, so hooking up VGA, I just get an out of range error. Let's see if there is something here that's gonna be supported by this screen. So it's currently sending at 1280 by 960, uh, but it looks like 1024 by 768 is what is recommended. So that didn't do anything. Uh, let's check frequency. So it's set to 60 hertz on the dot, but there is an option for 60.004 and 75.029. Let's try 60.004. Ah, there we go. So even though we're actually sending it a lot higher resolution than what the panel's actually rated at, um, again, this is 640 by 480 and we're sending it 1024 by 768. It, it's still legible. I mean, it doesn't look great if you look up close at some of the, um, the little icons and obviously the time here, but I can still make out that that says 1203, 30, 10, 2022. 20, so it still works as a PC display. Um, let's see if 75.029, very specific frequency works. And it does. Um, the image is a little bit off center. There is a gap here. And I think it's just cutting off a few pixels on that side, but we now have PC options. All right, so we can play around with frequency, phase, horizontal and vertical position, or we could just go auto adjust. Did that do anything? Oh, there we go. All right, that looks better. It's now centered. Yeah, text still not great, but um, you know, given that we're sending it a high resolution than what it actually can display, it's not too bad. Obviously like, I wouldn't be using this as a PC display anyway. I was more interested to see what it could support over VGA. So you can see what I'm seeing. There we go. Uh, this is going to be a little bit backwards for me now, but see if I can do this without confusing myself. Uh, let's try 800 by 600. Oh, yep, that worked. Mouse is on the other screen at the moment. Here it is. <laughs> um, yeah, not too bad at 800 by 600. It doesn't look like this actually goes down, like this laptop actually goes down any lower than that. So I don't even know if I've got a computer that can do like 640 by 480 or EGA kind of things. I probably do, but it probably doesn't work. So um, it's probably about the extent that I can test uh, the VGA connector with. So it works as a VGA display, but it's not really something that I'd be too concerned about using. In fact, 1280 by 960 would be double the resolution of this thing. So it would actually kind of be handy if that worked. Um, cause then yeah, everything should scale out correctly to just two pixels. But it does not like 1280 by 960 by the looks of it. What are you gonna do? So I guess the big question, how does it handle 240p and how much lag is introduced on this thing? Let's find out. All right, so I've got our 1084 here. We'll look at that in a second. But one thing I realized I forgot to do was test this with an NTSC signal. So this is a Super Famicom, which should put out a standard NTSC signal. And yeah, it handles NTSC just fine. So for composite and S video, this will make a difference. Um, once you get to RGB and component, they have different color encoding. So NTSC and PAL becomes a non-issue. 
And yeah, you can see on the NTSC version that it pretty much fills up the entire screen vertically. So this is just what you'll get with NTSC and obviously PAL, uh, it'll be a little bit squished down for a Super Nintendo anyway. But yeah, even on composite, it seems pretty decent. So um, now that that's out of the way, let's lag test this thing. Okay, so to do the lag test, we've got S-Video hooked up to the LCD panel and I've got composite running to the CRT. Obviously, you don't want to do this for too long because you're pulling two video sources out of the same console. So it could do damage if you try and run both video outputs long term, but I think for a short test, we should be okay. Let's just start off with the drop shadow test and it looks like the LCD is handling 240p just fine. Well, that's unexpected. Uh, there is also the stripe shadow test. And yeah, again, as you can see, the LCD looks exactly the same as the CRT. So it seems to handle this just fine. Let's see if I can get it to disappear. Yep. So yeah, this... This thing actually handles 240p correctly. That's, that's a surprise, but is it any good when it comes to lag? So for this test, I actually used my phone camera because it can record in super slow motion and uh, the results speak for themselves. I think it looks to be under a frame of lag, which is pretty impressive for an older LCD panel. About the only real issue I can see with the lag test is the refresh time is a little bit slow. So it kind of looks a little bit laggier than it actually is, but that's just because the LCD doesn't update the uh, pixels fast enough. So it may tend to smear fast moving objects a little bit, but that's perfectly fine with me. I wouldn't expect anything too much from such an old panel. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a time sleuth as much as I'd love to have one, but uh, I think due to the part shortage, they're pretty hard to get and uh, quite expensive at the moment. So uh, this is about the best I can do with the tools available. But um, yeah, I think it does prove that there's pretty much what would feel like zero lag on this panel. Now, while we're here, maybe we should just look at the final thing. The DVD player. Why is that not opening? Oh, there we go. Bit of a challenge to find DVDs, but I did find one. Let's not uh, lay any judgment on that. Ooh. So we've got disk loading, no disk. I can hear it is trying to read it, but dare I say the DVD player on this is not working. And now it's given up with no disk. What's kind of weird, if I swivel this around, yes, it does have a swivel base. Uh, the actual, the stop button seems to make it open and close, whereas the open and close button seems to do stuff all, so. It's a bit bizarre, but yeah, this thing looks to be in perfect shape. So it sounds like there's an issue with possibly the laser or something else. Let's try a CD. Let's see if the CD laser works. I can hear it trying to read. But much like the DVD, this doesn't seem to be working. It is still desperately trying to read that disc though. <laughs> it spun down and now it's spinning back up again. Oh. Oh. It's working. And that's where I'm going to have to stop that so I don't get a content match. But it did eventually work. But yeah, it did really struggle to um, play that. Yeah, I don't know if you can see the buttons, but um, the stop button is open and close. Bonkers. So although I said from the start that I'm a massive fan of CRTs, and I guess that hasn't really changed, something like this has just proven to me that you can actually find a decent LCD TV or panel 
uh, even if it is quite old. Obviously, you know, you're not going to buy this new in the store anymore, but you may see something like this in a thrift shop or a recycling center or op shop or whatever you want to call it in your area. So um, I'd actually keep an eye out for one of these. You might not get as lucky in terms of inputs and lag and the 240p processing, but this is certainly a good display just to, you know, a bit of casual gaming without having to rely on a CRT, which, uh, unless you have some repair skills, um, can be a bit hit and miss. Um, you could probably look out for a service and tested CRT, but they're going to run you quite a bit of money these days. And, um, for five bucks, I mean, there was a little bit of extra work, but you know, maybe even 20 bucks. If you find something like this, um, it might be worth picking up. At the end of the day, you can always uh, recycle it again or re-gift it or give it back to the thrift store as a charity donation, whatever. But uh, I think it's worth investigating these things before they all disappear. Now, of course, this particular one doesn't have a component input, but if you're playing sort of more modern-ish consoles, I'm talking like 2000s onwards, I'd probably want something that is widescreen anyway. I think this is perfect for anything pre-2000s, seeing as it's got all those inputs. And even if it was component video, I could get a RetroTINK. Uh, there's the Comp to RGB, uh, which converts 15 kilohertz component signals into RGB. I do actually have a RGB to comp hooked up to my Sony CRT over there um, because that only has a component input and no RGB input. And those things, like you'll pay a bit more than the cheap ones that you'll find on AliExpress, but they're pretty much just set and forget. You just plug in the input, plug in the output, and you're done. Uh, well, five volt power supply USB style. But that is all you need to do. I know a lot of the cheaper ones have little adjustments for the colors because you have to kind of set the colors just right. Otherwise it'll look off when you go from component to RGB or vice versa. But um, yeah, the retro tick one, you just plug it in and it looks perfectly fine. Like I wouldn't want to adjust it even if I could. So I'm more than happy using this as a nice little casual gaming setup. It's fairly compact. It doesn't weigh a ton like a CRT. I mean, it is fairly heavy, but it's got a pretty chunky stand on it. And um, it handles old school video signals just fine. And it'll even switch to RGB when I send a signal to it. So um, yeah, I'm more than happy using this thing for a bit of casual gaming. So I hope you all found this video interesting. It's certainly given me a new perspective on CRT panels, especially from this era. I didn't expect this to perform as good as it does. Again, it's only 640 by 480 and you can get higher resolution ones, but um, for a 20 inch four x three display, this thing is almost perfect. Now there is still the CD and DVD player to poke at, but uh, I might do that in another video if there's enough interest. If you want to see that, leave a comment down below. And um, likewise for the little tiny LCD display that I usually have set up. Um, yeah, if you want more info on that, let me know. As always, a huge thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same and get ad-free early access videos and encourage me to keep doing this kind of thing, um, check out the links below. Until next time, thank you all for watching the Retro Channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and all that jazz. And um, yeah, I will catch you in the next one. Bye. So ridiculous. Love it. Bastard.
Mm, power supply's warm, but it's certainly not hot. Yeah, it'll be fine. 